Hey guys, welcome to your very first lecture in psychology. I'm going to try to get us through the information quickly. Please understand that this is a companion to your textbook. It does not absolve you from reading the textbook, but for those of you who would like something to kind of help you along with that information, this is a really great starting point for all of the content that you should have further explanation given to you from the textbook. First thing we'll talk about is the definition of psychology. So when we're talking about psychology, we're talking about a scientific study of a behavior and a mental process. And yes, I see my typo, just ignore it. When we talk about a behavior, it's anything that is directly observable. So when people hear behavior, they think, why did the person behave? And that's not a psychological way of thinking about behaviors. In psychology, behaviors are what you can see. I can see a dog salivate. I can see a person sweat. I can even see a person fidget with their fingers, but what I can't say is the sweat came from them exercising or the sweat came from them being nervous. I can't say the fidgeting fingers is an indication of anxiety. All I can say is what I see. I saw the dog salivate. I saw the person fidget. I see the person sweat. It also has to do with mental processes anything that's unobservable. So again, that explanation as to why sometimes, like why was the dog salivating? You would conclude because the dog was hungry. So that would be an unobservable process. You can't ask a dog if it's hungry. You can make that assumption. So anything that falls under the realms of thoughts, feelings, dreams, memories, those are mental processes. So psychology is a scientific study of what we see, human behavior, and all of the mental processes that drive those behaviors. Psychology has to be more than common sense. To make it more than common sense, we rely on research. Research in psychology can be basic and help develop the base knowledge that we have, or it can be applied. So if you have an interest in becoming a developmental psychologist, you might want to find out why do babies do certain things? Why or how do babies take on language or how do babies uh, problem solve. That would be very developmental, but that just kind of adds to our understanding of the why. If you're doing applied research, you're actually trying to solve a problem. So if you're looking at Alzheimer's disease, you might be looking at the neuroscience behind it, what's happening to neurons. You might be looking at cognitive flexibility, how much we use our brains as we get older, do we challenge them? Does that even make a difference when we talk about trying to fix Alzheimer's disease? You might be looking at things like acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter that is often lacking in this disorder. You're trying to solve a problem and your research is there to solve the problem. Again, be wary of common sense and even pop psychology. They tend to be the two biggest things that hamper people from understanding actual psychology. If your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do it? Common sense would say no, because if your parents have ever asked you that, you know your response has to be no. But the reality is, yeah, if your friend jumped off a bridge, chances are you would too. Because if we research it, we start looking at why we select certain people to be our friends. They're often like us. There's often conformity in larger numbers of people. So when we start looking at maybe the social psychology aspect, yeah, we trust our friends. We pick people who have similar values and norms to us and people often that we appreciate and trust. We're gonna get into some of the major founders of psychology. Now, if you were to Google search who is the father of psychology, you could come up with a list of a variety of different names going all the way back to the ancient Greeks. In this course, we're talking about scientific psychology modern psychology. Psychology has its roots in philosophy and physiology. So you really can go really far back and find out that some people will consider Aristotle to be the father of psychology. Really more philosophy. The person that we're going to be concerned with is this man here, Wilhelm Wundt. He's German, so the W's make a V sound. He's the first person to set up a research laboratory about psychology, blending the philosophical, the why are we, with the, physiolog or the physiological, what are we. He does this in Leipzig, Germany in 1879. Please understand the reason we talk about the history and a lot of these people is psychology is a baby science. It's only been around for a little over a hundred years, closer to about 140. That's nothing in comparison to biology 
or physics or chemistry, it's in its infancy. Wundt used something called introspection. Now, when we talk about introspection, especially today, we're talking about essentially self-awareness. But he meant introspection in a connection between the physiological and the brain. And so he wanted to know, at what point would a person recognize a ticking of a watch in a silent room? When would they consciously become aware of this? At what point would a person consciously become aware that the amount of light in a room has changed? Today, we'll sit there and say, there's a certain amount of introspection when we try to attach our feelings to a changing environment. So his entire theory was, could you record these things? Could you measure them? Could you put them into some sort of research methodology? One of his students is E.B. Titchener, and Titchener we will not spend a lot of time on. In fact, this is really the only time we talk about Titchener. He's a student of Wundt, and what his major contribution is, is that he establishes the first psychological theory or perspective called structuralism. With structuralism, what I want you to see is the word structure. What he was interested in is that conscious experience, what made it? So if I were to give you a robot and say, you are now tasked with programming this robot, robot to have artificial intelligence. I want you to give it an experience just like ours. You would have to start thinking, what is our experience? Is it thoughts? Is it feelings? Is it taking in information from the sensory world? What exactly makes up the idea of being a conscious person? Because it's not just being alert or aware, but alertness and awareness also come into that definition. Structuralism and another way, if that just seems a little too abstract for you, if I were to ask you, what is the structure of the wall that you're looking at? Well, if you're at home, it might be that you're staring at some two by fours that are covered in drywall and there's paint on them. I'm not asking you what the wall does for you. I'm just asking you what structures make it up. Structuralism looked at thoughts and sensations as those basic components for your conscious experience. One of the greatest contributions of structuralism wasn't that it was such a great theory. Its greatest contribution is that it gave others a theory to prove wrong. From structuralism, we'll get functionalism. From functionalism, we'll get psychoanalysis. From psychoanalysis, we'll get behaviorism. From behaviorism, we'll get humanism. Again, this is a very infant science and so giving others something to argue against builds what we know. Gestalt psychology arises right around the same time as an alternative to structuralism, and Gestalt psychology is my favorite. That and behavioral psychology. Struct, or, gestalt psychology looks at the whole experience. It looks at everything. It's all about perception. And so it can bring into question what is reality. And I don't mean this in a philosophical sense. I mean literally what is reality. I always like to ask students a very simple question. Which travels faster, a light wave or a sound wave? Now, I don't know how well this is gonna read over the internet, but in a classroom, it makes sense. Everyone sits there and tells me, light waves travel faster. And I'm like, great. So if a light wave travels faster, the light that is actually bouncing off my physical form back into your eyes for your brain to process vision is hitting you momentarily faster than the sound waves that are emitted from my mouth that have to go to your ears and then process through your brain for you to perceive sound. If those two things travel at different rates of speed, then why isn't that in many cases, why don't we see a delay between what we see and what we hear? And there's a really simple answer for that. Your brain puts everything on about a one third of second delay. Everything that you perceive happened about a third of a second ago. So it's such a small adjustment that we really don't notice it. But the reality is that everything that we're experiencing, well, it happened in the past. So Gestalt psychology I like because it deals with all these questions about what we sense versus what we actually perceive. It does talk about meaningful holes. So one way to kind of understand Gestalt psychology is if I were to ask you, listening to a piece of music, do you listen to an individual instrument and the notes that it plays? Or do you enjoy all of the instruments together as a whole? Gestalt psychology looks at the whole, not just the small elements, but the entire integrated piece. 
this is a form of gestalt. So do you see a Wolverine or two Batman? And it depends. I've seen this so many times, I can flip back and forth, but the first time I saw it, I saw a Wolverine. Now, it just depends on where I'm staring. So how your brain organizes information might be unique to you, but it's really kind of just this entire thing that's perception. Oh, and the cool thing about this is that because your brain can only selectively attend to one image at a time, you cannot see Batman and Wolverine simultaneously. You can only see either the two faces or the one face. And we'll get into that more when we get into sensation and perception. After we get through structuralism, we go into functionalism. And functionalism is all about what it does for us. So we're still talking about essentially the conscious experience and the person who comes up with this idea of functionalism is William James. Now he's considered the father of American psychology. He disagreed with Wundt and Titchener and said that structuralism really isn't the most important thing about our conscious experience, not what it's made of, but what does it allow us to do? Why do we have it? And in 1890, he was the first person to write a textbook in psychology called The Principles of Psychology. He stated, the goal of psychology was to study the functions of consciousness or the ways consciousness helps people adapt to their environment. So not what is it, but why do we have it? Our conscious experience is different than that of other animals in the animal kingdom. That's not to say that your dog or your cat isn't aware of what's going on, but they don't necessarily have the same level of concern that we have for people that aren't part of our pack or our pride. They don't necessarily think the way that we do. So their conscious experience is slightly different than a human experience. We're very unique within the animal kingdom. Functional psychology, why do we have a conscious experience? What function does it provide? So it looks at mental life and behaviors in terms of what it allows us to do. What adaptive abilities has it given us? A really interesting way of looking at it would be the idea of pain. Pain is actually a mental construct. It's a bunch of information coming from your body to your brain and it's your brain that makes you feel pain, which is why if we give you a certain drug and we don't let the neurotransmitters in your brain go and we don't let the neurons communicate, you don't feel pain. So why do we have pain? What's the, the function to that? And the answer is pain reminds us that we have somehow really damaged our body and we need to stop. I always call it the hey stupid button. It basically, if you've ever twisted an ankle, you put weight on that and your brain immediately goes, hey stupid, get off the ankle. That's why it's there. It has a purpose, a function to serve us. And it's one of our best teachers. After functionalism, we get Sigmund Freud. Now I have some strong feelings about Freud, um, mostly because almost everything he's ever created was proven wrong later. And everybody loves Freud because he just talks about the weirdest stuff and it's repeated in English classes and everyone thinks it's amazing. And there's some pretty strong problems with it. So first off, he is not the father of psychology. He might be one of the most well-known and honestly, that's probably his greatest contribution. Everybody knows of Freud or has heard of it or has seen um, somewhere in a meme or a TV show or somewhere in pop media, someone laying on a couch talking to a person behind them and telling them all their problems. That's Freud. So Freud didn't like functionalism and did not like structuralism because they didn't talk about your unconscious. He felt that there was something deep residing in us that we couldn't connect with. It was hidden from us. So he creates what's called the psychoanalytic perspective, psychoanalysis, and sometimes called the psychodynamic perspective. He's the first one to talk about personality theory, which back then was very, very philosophical and theoretical, and today actually a lot more scientific. He wanted to understand what happens, how do we behave literally in the emotional sense, what fuels it? And he says that it often comes from unconscious drives and conflicts within ourselves. And we'll get into Freud. Freud is some weird stuff, but the unconscious drives, he would say things like, you behave a certain way because you have a resentment towards a parent, but that resentment's too much for you to deal with, so you hide it in your unconscious, but that's why maybe you don't seem to agree with them very often. Or he might say, that's why you always agree with them. 
it, it can get really kind of confusing. Most people have heard of some Freudian psychology, a Freudian slip. So the, when you say one word and you mean another, or in this case, when you mean your mother, because he had a really big issue with moms, um, you might sit there and accidentally tell the person checking you out at the grocery and when they say, have a good day, you say, I love you. And you're like, oh, I didn't mean to say that. Freud would sit there and say that that's a Freudian slip, that it's a window into your unconscious. What the rest of us would say in modern psychology is that essentially you have a pre-programming for certain phrases and responses and you just tripped the wrong wire. And so the wrong response came out because you probably weren't paying attention. He came up with lots of other things that you may have heard of before, like free association. So while this comic down at the bottom is not really all that funny, it gives you this kind of idea of how he did a lot of his therapy, which was free association. So he thought that everything happened from abnormal or any abnormal behavior happened from early childhood experiences, traumas, over parenting, things like that. We would say today that yes, early childhood experiences matter, but we're often acutely aware of them. He relied on the subject's observations and one of the biggest knocks to Freud is that this is all observational theory. He didn't really do any systematic research. And again, free association, he would ask people to do things like just to start talking and to say whatever came to mind. And eventually he would try to draw connections between the words that they left. Dream analysis. I know some of you guys are super excited about this and you're like, oh, I'm going to figure out what my dreams mean. They don't really mean anything. They're really good indications of what's stressing you out. But as far as them telling you something about yourself that you didn't know, unfortunately, that's just not real. Most of Freud's ideas, like I've said before, are out of date or disproved, but elements still exist. And even as you see in this cartoon right here, it tends to get referenced quite a bit. So Freud is known for something called the Oedipus Complex. He got the idea of the Oedipus Complex from the story of Oedipus Rex. And I don't mean that he thought that that Greek tragedy was truth. It's just that he knew of this story and then he saw elements of what he thought was an example of this in young children. So if you don't know the story of Oedipus Rex, the Cliff Notes version is Oedipus was born under a prophecy that he would kill his father and then marry his mother. And hearing the prophecy, his father decided that they were going to put the baby on an island far, far away and let the baby die. Unfortunately, the baby doesn't die. He is found by a rival kingdom. That rival kingdom raises him and as he gets older, he goes to war against his home country not knowing that this is his mother and his father. He kills his father and for the spoils of war, he takes his mother as his bride. So most of us right now are all thinking, ick, that's disgusting and how in the world could that become part of anyone's theory of psychology? Well, Freud said that that little boy who's clinging to his mother's skirt and won't let go or seems overly attached to her, it's because he actually has a sexual desire towards her. As a mother, especially a mother of a young boy, that just grosses me out because that is not true. In fact, what we know now is that child that's in, you know, has a deep connection with their parent is probably a really healthy kid that they probably have a good sense of attachment and that as long as that child is willing to go out and explore the world, they're okay. So we do look at Freud and people really like to get into it. Later we'll talk about defense mechanisms. Um, if you've ever heard someone say, I repress that, that's all Freudian psychology. Modern version of Freud's theory, the psychodynamic theory, does still look at unconscious drives and conflicts, but is much more research-based. So yes, some unconscious thoughts and conflicts. If you've been stressing over something and then you see somebody who is the kind of crux of your stress and you immediately feel like you don't like them or you're immediately, your emotions change immediately from that, we would sit there and go, yeah, at an unconscious level, that kind of triggered it. There are other things that we'll talk about later, especially when we talk about memory and conditioning that do have some elements of this kind of unconscious thought inner conflict. Some of the things that we'll talk about, will you marry your mother or father? I mean that in someone who is like that. And the answer is, well, yes and no. We tend to marry people who have familiar personalities. And if you like your mom or your dad, you may find someone who has your mother's confidence and your dad's sense of humor, but is not your mom or dad. 
we'll talk about defense mechanisms. All right, behaviorism. This is my other favorite. I like behaviorism because of the science. It's strictly scientific. When we talk about behaviorism, I probably should put John B. Watson up first because he's the father of behaviorism, but the man who got the ball kind of rolling in this perspective is going to be Pavlov. So many of you guys have probably heard of Pavlov's dog. Ivan Pavlov was not a psychologist. He's a Russian physiologist. He looked at how dogs' digestive secretions worked. But what he found out was that when he would walk past dogs, his footsteps often caused the dogs to salivate. And it was because the dogs would hear footsteps and they would anticipate food. And so he started looking at how a stimulus like footsteps could cause a physiological reaction like salivating when it could all be tied together with something that should normally cause the salivating, the food. So if you've ever heard of um, the salivating to a bell, what Pavlov later did was he would ring a bell anytime he presented the dogs with food and eventually ringing the bell caused the dogs to salivate. This is all what we'll call associative learning. So we learn through associations. Again, here's Pavlov's experiment, and we'll talk more about this when we get into behaviorism, but this entire idea that you could bring something that has no power to cause a response, and as long as you tie it into something that always causes a response, you'll get that new thing to cause the same response. I know that sounds like a little weird and doesn't always kind of hold true, but if you guys have ever played the circle game, and I think some of you are probably trying to figure out what that is. If you've ever made kind of the okay sign with your hand and put it below your waist, if someone looked at that, you have the right to, well, you don't have the right, but you could go up and either neck them or they have to smack the back of their head. If you've ever met someone who's played this really silly game and you make that hand gesture, watch them flinch or cringe. Or you can even ask them, did your heart rate increase? Well, I should be able to walk around all day long going thumbs up or making AOK -okay signs without anyone having a physiological reaction. However, if that person has played this game and they know that if you look at that symbol made with the hand, that the next thing's going to happen is they're going to get slapped in the back of the head and that's going to hurt, the symbol now causes or triggers them to have a physical reaction. Then we get to Watson. So John B. Watson is the, fa or the father of behavioral psychology. And I'll tell students, if you need to remember why he is, just think John B., John Behavioral Watson, obviously not his real name. He does not like Freud. In fact, he says, Freud talks about all of this unconscious stuff. Have him prove it. He says, you cannot call this a science if you are going to study things that cannot be studied. And so psychology has to be purely objective. It has to look at just what is scientific. And so he makes behaviorism the purely observable, the most purely, purely scientific of the perspectives. He's famous for what we'll later talk about in classical conditioning, but he's famous for um, the Baby Albert study. And in the Baby Albert study, again, this is associative learning. Don't worry about having to memorize the study. We'll talk about this again when we talk about behaviorism. But Baby Albert was a 18-month-old child. He was given a small white rat, and he found the rat interesting. Didn't fear the rat, just found the rat interesting, like any 18-month-old baby would. What they would do is they would come up behind ba our Baby Albert, and they would make a really loud noise. They would take two pieces of metal and clang them together. Well, if you've ever been around a small child, making a really loud noise will startle them, and when they startle, they often cry. Well, for baby Albert, every time they brought the rat, they would make the noise, the noise would cause the baby to cry. They'd bring the rat, they'd make the noise, the noise would cause the, ba or cause the baby to cry. They'd make or bring the rat, make the noise, baby cries, and eventually, the baby sees the rat and starts crying. This study actually gives us some insights to how phobias might establish themselves. How a person may have a extreme fear of a dog after a single dog bite. Maybe this one time in their childhood, they got bit by a dog and it caused pain. And instead of going, all right, bite causes pain, they go, dogs cause pain. And it became what we'll call a conditioned emotional response. That you have a really strong emotional response to a conditioned experience. 
B.F. Skinner is another one, and for those of you guys who ever think you might become parents, this is the crux of every parenting video. Uh, if you don't think you'll ever become parents, but you might own a dog, this is the crux of every dog training video, and I'm not saying children or dogs, but I use this heavily with my own kids. B.F. Skinner looked at behavior modification through reinforcement and punishment. When we get to this, I'm going to show you guys that punishment actually does not increase good behavior, and reinforcement doesn't always mean getting a treat. There's positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement, positive punishment and negative punishment. In psychology, when we talk about positive and negative, we're not talking about good or bad. We're talking about the direction of travel or the addition or subtraction of something. Positive reinforcement, you get something. Negative reinforcement, you get to avoid something. So you get to avoid what you don't like. The behavior should increase. With punishment, positive punishment, a consequence is added that should decrease the behavior. And then negative punishment, something is taken away that should decrease the behavior. I have a 10 and an 11 year old, and I will tell you over the last decade, I have used more reinforcement techniques than I have punishment techniques. And it makes parenting much easier. And my kids know that if they don't behave well with the reinforcements, punishment does show up. So we'll talk about that, how we can modify, how we can reward, how we can change behaviors through a bunch of different systems. Behaviors perspective, again, is all of those researchers that we just talked about, Watson, Skinner, Pavlov, and very specific wording that you should kind of pick up on, anything that's observable, anything that's rewarded, anything that's punished, and anything that's associated. Humanistic psychology is probably the other really large school of psychology. Psychoanalysis, behavioral, humanistic. It doesn't mean that there aren't other perspectives that we'll talk about, but it tends to be one of the big three. Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow are going to be the two major theorists. And with humanistic psychology, this one is definitely really more the philosophical one that is modernly kept. Um, not philosophical in the way that Freud was, but more that it believes that people are good, rational people that are trying to fulfill themselves and become the best versions of themselves. Rogers is known for what's called client-centered therapy, and he has a term called unconditional positive regard. So if you've ever heard of the term of unconditional love, it means the person loves you without any kind of strings attached. There's also conditional love. Well, unconditional positive regard, you see your patient as a good person no matter what they tell you, conditional regard, they have to prove to you that they're a good person. Rogers felt that the client should be at the center of all therapeutic endeavors and that the therapist should give that person unconditional positive regard, see them as a good person no matter what they say. That's a very difficult thing to do in therapy. Abraham Maslow created what is known as the hierarchy of needs and had a theory of the fact that people, when their basic needs are met, can then meet their emotional needs. And then once their emotional needs are met, they can meet their personal needs and become what he called self-actualized, the height of human experience. They believe that people were more important than the things that made them up, that the whole person was greater than the sum of their parts. The biggest keywords for this, free will and the ability to reach their full potential. That's what humanists really looked at. The problem with this, much like psychoanalysis, is that there's not a lot of scientific research to back it. It's very theoretical. The cognitive perspective, this one really isn't a school of thought, but it is a perspective. Cognitive perspective looks very much at how people think, how we take in information, how we store it, how we retrieve it, how we process it. We'll spend time looking at this when we talk about problem solving and memory. When we talk about cognitive perspective, it's all of the different little gears in your head that have to turn for you to think. It talks about the fact that problems usually take two major forms in our heads. The methodical rule-based solutions that we do step by step by step, or what we'll call heuristics. The correct answer isn't guaranteed, but these are really more like rules of thumb. They usually work out in our favor. So think righty-tighty, lefty-loosey is a heuristic. It works out probably about 95% of the time when you're trying to unscrew something. And there might be a small percentage where you find out that righty-tighty is just wrong. 
The last person we're going to talk about is Jean Piaget. Jean Piaget is a developmental psychologist and what he looked at and studied was how thought and problem solving changes with age. So he looked primarily at children. Piaget is still really, really influential in the education system and a lot of what he had to say is absolutely still spot on and correct with a couple of tweaks. So he studied how children develop in their thinking. Now what I will tell you is that you cannot talk to a three-year-old the way that you would talk to a seven-year-old or a seven-year-old the way you would talk to a 12-year-old and a 12-year-old is actually pretty close to talking to everybody else. They're just modifying everything. So he looked at how children change in the way that they think. And I always like Calvin and Hobbes because Calvin's supposed to be a young kid who believes that his stuffed tiger is actually alive. So it puts him in what Piaget would have considered probably a pre-operational stage, his second stage of cognitive development. And it's fun because you see this, he puts the bread into the toaster and then a few minutes toast pops up and Hobbes, who is essentially supposed to be Calvin's conscious or consciousness, goes, where did the bread go? And so you sit there and you go, oh, this is really cool. He doesn't have the ability to reverse the thought and understand that the bread transformed to toast. Now, if I did this to my kids, even when they were nine, they would look at me and just tell me to leave them alone. And probably even when they were seven. But if I did this when they were three or four, they might have been a little more surprised until they understood the trick behind it. It's just this idea that cognition, our ability to problem solve and think changes as we get older. The next video I promise is going to be super short. It will not run this long. Please use this with your textbook to prepare for your quizzes and to understand all the content. We will be using and referencing a lot of these people as we go throughout the course.